think we'll go ahead and get started today. First up, we have some informational briefings from uh, the Kansas Motor Carriers and the Division of Vehicles on some issues some of you may have heard. I was hoping Senator Tyson would have been here. I know she has some of those in her district, but I'm sure she'll jump online as soon as she can. With that, we'll turn it over to Tom Whitaker, Executive Director of Kansas Motor Carriers. Welcome back to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for the opportunity to discuss entry-level driver training. This is the reg book. No, this is for all motor carrier regulations, uh, but if we get into technical questions, I'll be able to look it up and answer it for you today. But you have packets in front of you, and the entry-level driver training was actually approved as a regulation in 2016. It has been postponed and postponed and postponed. And as of February 7th of this year, uh, they began to enforce the regulations. So anybody that gets a commercial driver's license after February 7th has to go through what they call entry-level driver training. And what that consists of is a theory portion on all the regs that involve uh, commercial driver's license, the operation of commercial driver's license, hours of service, all of those things, which will help that individual pass the written portion of the CDL test and therefore get their learner's permit so they can take the driving portion of the test. Uh, you know, there's been some concern on the internet that, oh my God, it costs $4,000 to do this. You got to go to a truck driving school to do this. Uh, Senator Bowers has one of the most excellent CDL schools right there in her community in the North Central Kansas Technical. Yeah, in Beloit. And uh, so there are a lot of those. You can go online to the FMCSA website and see everybody in Kansas that's registered to be a certified trainer. Now there is the public side of it, which a lot of our technical colleges are set up to do that. There are some private truck driving schools that are also available that can be done. But if you click on the little button that says see all, you'll see the private ones as well. And what's interesting is every substation of the Kansas Department of Transportation has a trainer in place to do this. Um, in your community, Mr. Chairman, uh, Metro Express, uh, JNH Trucking, uh, and House of Swan has their trainers already uh, set to do the entry-level entry level driver training. I want to reiterate, this is the uniform commercial driver's license. It is in uniform in every state in the nation. Um, it was adopted in Kansas in 1989, and the bill on the Senate floor was carried by the senator from Cloud, Senator Doyen, and uh, it was 144 pages long, and it took 65 seconds to get the bill advanced to final action. So it was kind of an interesting spot to sit in the gallery for a very short time. Um, but every state has this, and the idea of a CDL is, number one, make sure they take the test in the class of vehicle they're going to operate. Kansas has always had the A for tractor trailers and the heavy truck combinations, where you had to take the road tests in that type of equipment. But for years, states like Missouri, you could take your road test in a Volkswagen Beetle and drive a semi. That stopped then. The other thing that happened is truck drivers used to to have in some cases where they had a lot of tickets have more than one driver's license. This eliminated 
having more than one driver's license where you can mask your, your violations when it was put into place. There are limited exemptions from the CDL, and I'm going to touch on some of the things you've been hearing about from uh, the ag community, especially custom harvesters. But you are exempt in Kansas and under the federal law if you're operating a farm truck, registered as a farm truck, used within the laws of govern how you can operate a farm truck and not used as a for hire carrier, um, you are exempt within 150 air miles of your farm. And that goes across state lines as well uh, from a commercial driver's license. So all you need is a regular class A and not a CDL and therefore not subject to this entry level driver training. Custom harvesters are a different story. Um, they cannot operate with a farm tag. They don't meet the net definition because they are technically for hire when they go out and harvest your crops and haul your grain. So they don't meet that and they do have a problem. And frankly, in 2015, when this rule was being promulgated, I talked to the United States Custom Harvesting Association. I said, you're going to have a problem in 2015. I said, you need an exemption because you bring these people over, you have to train them. And now they've added more training requirements to it. Then they're there for the harvest. And uh, they did not pursue an exemption. And now that it's here, there is, um, let's just say the wheel is squeaking from the custom harvesting, and they definitely have a problem. Uh, we've been in contact with uh, Senator Marshall's office has called us. Several of the custom cutters have called us. And I think Kent Selk with the Division of Vehicles is going to talk about what the department's tried to do to make life easier for them under the ELDT. Um, and uh, I think it will help them in the long run. But again, it's every state is going through this. It is a uniform driver's license uh, governed by the regs of the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. And in your packet, um, I have put in the flow chart from FMCSA. It's pretty easy to read to see if you're subject or not. Uh, on the application for CDL, um, if you've not had a CDL before and it says no, then do you have any of the exceptions? And no. Uh, and then it breaks it down before February 7th. If I had a le learner's permit issued before February 7th, I'm not subject to the entry level driver training. After the 7th, I am. Uh, then it goes on to what carrier, wh who is subject. The entry-level driver training also applies to endorsements for passenger, school bus, and hazardous materials, where you have to have the entry-level training to get those endorsements on your commercial driver's license. So an example would be I've got a regular CDL, which I don't have, uh, but um, and I want to haul a placarded load of hazardous materials. In order to do that, I have to have a hazardous material endorsement. And under this, I would have to go through training for that endorsement, uh, both the theory and be able to know how the particular vehicle works is along with uh, shipping papers and all the requirements, the hazardous materials. And the trainer would go into the registry on the federal government and say, yes, I've met all the requirements. So before the department would issue me the hazmat endorsement, they would check that registry to make sure that I had completed the ELDT before the state would issue a endorsement on that one. So there's two sections. One is the endorsements uh, that go with the CDL, and the other one is 
just a regular commercial driver's license. Again, the idea is to make the training as uniform as possible, so uh, the people that are getting behind the 18-wheelers, the wheel of them, are at least trained. Now, in Kansas, we get a lot of our drivers from the farm communities who've driven. In Kansas, you can be 18 and drive a tractor trailer from border to border. Uh, but you can't go from Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri, without being 21. Uh, but we get a lot of them from there. They will have to do the, the training. And uh, one of my incoming president, Mass Trucking, out of Copeland, Kansas, uh, signed up to do their own training. They have a safety director, and they're training now, training drivers that they will have available probably within four to six months to operate their trucks uh, because as you all have heard, there's a tremendous of, shortage of truck drivers, about 80,000 short right now. And, uh, just, and we're not alone. Every industry is looking for help, uh, bottom line. Uh, but. What else is in the packet is the exemption for the farms, farmers, as well as the federal regs that deal with the exemption. And so when somebody calls, if they have a farm vehicle and it's registered as a farm vehicle and they stay within 150 air miles of their farm, they aren't subject. And that's probably been one of the biggest questions a lot of folks have had. So, Mr. Chairman, with that, I'm open to any questions that the committee may have. Senator Wilborn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Whitaker, very, uh, very informative uh, for me, a new member of the committee. I have a question as it relates to the farm exemption. As you know, a lot of farmers then do custom cutting work to subsidize that $500,000 combine. There's kind of a tweener between custom cutting and the farm exemption. Is there delineation anywhere in there to accommodate that issue? Well, if you were doing it for custom harvesting, you wouldn't be able to use a farm tag. And therefore, not being able to use a farm tag under the definition that's in here and under the federal definition, uh, they would be required to do the ELDT if they were going to go into that side of the business. There is, uh, I even hate to mention it, there is a little barter and trade exemption. If you want to cut your neighbor's field and do those things, you're still okay under a farm vehicle tag. Senator Pittman. So this is a federal, kind of a federal mandate, right? It is a federal mandate. Is there any action that the state needs to take in regard to this? I'll let uh, the okay. Department of Revenue respond to that. I don't believe that there is. They've implemented it. Um, but I'll let them respond on what the government has to do. Thanks. We do adopt these regulations periodically. The Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations are adopted through the Kansas Corporation Commission Transportation Division. So, and they try and update them on an annual basis, but it does take a long time to get a rule and reg through the system, as we all know. Senator Dietrich. Thank you so much. Very interesting presentation. So, when you're talking about uniformity and the training, uh, and say you're, you live in Maryland, you've gone through the training, you have a CDL, you have all the endorsements that you need, does, does that then reciprocate across the United States? It does. Okay. Yeah, that's... Uh, that's one of the concerns if you get out of compliance with the uniform commercial driver's license is, is the neighboring state going to accept your driver's license? That's why the uniform, I can drive anywhere just like I can with my automobile. I can drive anywhere in the United States as long as I've got that, and Canada, as long as I've got my driver's license. CDL, the same situation. So what if I relocate to Utah? Uh, do I have to go through the same process that you do with a regular driver's license? You would go to the DMV and and uh, reset your residency. 
and that's really all you have to do. Yep. Thank you. Committee, further questions for Tom? Seeing none, thank you. And I'll be around if there are further questions, Mr. Chairman. Excellent, thank you. Ken Selk, you're up. Welcome back to the committee. Thank you, sir. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, appreciate you giving us a few minutes here. I'll uh, touch on what you said. We adopted the Uniform Commercial Driver's License Act, like you said, in 89, and in that statute it states that the state will stay in compliance with the federal government. There's a few things that we've done that we haven't had to have a rule and reg on. This is one of them. Medical card was the other. So there are times we do come to you, and if it has to be added because uh, a statute has it specifically near, say, a restriction code or whatever, those are usually when we come to you to have to have, open it back up to fix it. But in this case, we just adopted it as it was. Um, real quick, I'm just going to touch on a couple, a couple things with driver's license issuance, kind of a little bit away from there. And um, custom harvesting obviously is the biggest piece, right? Squeaky wheel is probably the best way to, to explain it. And um, those guys have a very small window. And the window seems to decrease each year. It takes them a little bit longer to get their people from other countries into the United States. USCIS is a little bit slow. Um, but I'm pretty proud of what we've done in Kansas in the past. We, we pay a lot of attention to them. Uh, just an example, the year that we were shut down for COVID, I actually had our examiners volunteer when we were on shutdown, come in and take care of our custom harvesters. Um, so I don't fear that we're going to have a, a major issue this year. Um, Tom kind of mentioned, you know, he's, he's talked to him. We talked to him quite a bit. Uh, the one thing you can do there's no rule that says you can't be a training provider. You can, you can be H&H &H Farms, and if you've got a trainer, you can just go to the, the federal website. It does not cost you anything. It's a self-certification process. You set it up, and then you can be a, a provided trainer. No different than a nursery, meaning like a, a small construction company, these smaller carriers. They can all set up and become entry-level driver training facilities, which is kind of what we've, we've kind of explain to them on some concerns. I know there's a few people that have called about everybody up here at one time on it. Um, so there's no rule. There's nothing against it. If you've got a trainer, just much like he's mentioned with KDOT, USD, USDs do it for school buses, same thing. Um, so that way these individuals aren't having to send somebody somewhere to be trained. Also with the cost deal, uh, there's no cap on it, right? There's no, we don't set the price. It's not our thing. The federal government also does never sets a price on anything that it does with training. They just won't do it. If you go to a full on trucking school, yes, you're going to be somewhere in the $4,000 range. If you go there and you're issued a CDL at the end of it, there are ELDT strict pro just, that's all you're going to get is ELDT training. And it's around 450 to $500 from what I've seen. So it's obviously greatly reduced because there's no hours requirement. Um, we don't regulate it. I want to also make sure you understand that. I'm not going out and auditing the ELDT schools. Um, we audit our CDL third party locations, um, and that's what we take care of because they, they're actually issuing the credential at the, end of the, at the end of it. The other thing is you do not have to have ELDT to come in and get a learner's permit. You can come get your learner's permit. You have the 14-day waiting period. That's kind of the federal government's theory of that would be your time to, to go um, do your ELDT training. You only have to have it provided by the time you come back to take your skills test. Um, so just so everybody's aware of that, we don't require it to come get a permit. Now, it's also not required, like Tom had mentioned, it's not required to have a CDL permit to go to ELDT. So there's a little bit of a confusion. There was a couple people that thought that they had to have a permit to go and they were a little bit wound up, but they don't. It's not a requirement to do that. You can go, go do ELDT first, get it, that part of it out of the way, come get a permit, and you know, as long as it's proven, we'll take care of it. Um, so there's a little bit of confusion, I think, with that. Kind of jumped here just a little bit. So back to our custom harvesters, that 14-day waiting period, we've been able to waive in Kansas. So when they come in, we're not making these guys wait 14 days after they get their permit. Um, we also intensify our presence with the custom harvesters. So um, our CDL team, along with the CDL auditors, they are out in Western Kansas training, helping, getting these guys in and out on skills test. And I, we've done a really good job of making sure that we're not holding these guys up. You're going to have some stragglers, okay? They're going to have some people that come in late. They always do. Um, they may get here, but yeah, they do. They'll get here by June because of something held them up. And those kind of throw a little bit of a wrench in them, but we take care of them as well. 
Um, so we're, we're fully prepared and on board to help these guys out. I don't foresee us having a major issue with our, our custom harvest operation this year. If you guys get them, they ask you any questions, by all means, let them send them my way and we'll, we'll take care of them, reassure them it's going to be all right. Um, just a couple other things real quick. We, I sent in an email it into you guys. It just has our CDL skills offices on here, just some good information for you so you know where those are located. Um, we did do a big thing in Seneca right before this had happened. The word got out from the local co-op up there, it got all the local uh, agriculture people pretty riled up. So we spent about three or four weeks, we ended up testing just under 200 drivers prior to ELDT. So we, we tried really hard to get in some, some education, get some things done for these guys. Um, so we were pretty happy with that. Uh, we've also shortened up the time frame out in Garden City. It was kind of mentioned in early in one of the committees I was in that we were kind of backed up there. So I sent some reinforcements that direction and we got them kind of cleaned back up there about six weeks out. Now they're only about two. So we kind of got them back in, in, in compliance. And to give you an idea, CDL skills test wise, we're running about a week, two weeks average. There's some places that might be a little bit more. Um, other states such as Texas, larger ones, that's where you're hearing a lot of complaints because they're six months to a year in some of their places to, to schedule a CDL skills test with their state. Um, so overall, I'm pretty proud and pretty happy where we're at. Um, a few weeks is really isn't, isn't too, too, too bad in the long run. So um, we continue to do everything we can. One other real quick thing, this is not, you do not have to do ELDT to have re restrictions removed. So say I came in at one time and I brought my F-350 in a big old trailer and I got a combination license, but I didn't get air brakes and I have no tractor trailer or no manual transmission. You do not have to go through ELDT to have those removed in any capacity. You also don't have to have it to do doubles and triples endorsement or tanker. So I know it's in that flow chart, but I just thought I'd kind of mention that so you guys are aware. Um, air brakes is a big one. Usually people when they go to school bus, or not school bus, but a lot of times, especially in smaller construction companies, they'll do that. They'll get them in a, a whatever, heavy straight truck or a one ton with a trailer so they're over. And they'll see if they're going to work for them for a while. And then they'll move them on to the bigger equipment. Um, and so to do an air brake restriction, it's the same thing. You just do a knowledge test and come take the, the pre-trip inspection and you're on your way. So that's kind of our most popular one that we usually have to do. With that, I'll, I'll stand for questions. Committee, questions. Senator Pittman. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for all that information. Uh, living on the east coast of Kansas, uh, we don't have these custom harvesters coming up there. But um, what's the what's the season basically look like in terms of the timing? And then how many individuals are you talking about that come in for this kind of temporary service to our state? That's a, that's a really good point. So your your time frame is going to start somewhere right about now. We'll, we'll start getting calls from them basically March ish through should be May. You know, April, May is when we should have them out, but we do have a few stragglers around June because by that time you should already be in Texas and going back up when they're doing their harvest. That's kind of when they used to, they like to get there. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, I don't have the exact number to you, but it's, it's around 200 and 250 drivers. We're not talking thousands of custom harvesters that we're issuing. Um, the issue just is, is the time sensitivity and, and you know, that it's a, it's a very, unique niche operation that they've got. So you're right, on the east side, we, we don't have much. We do have some carnival workers that are kind of the same way. They're down in Wichita. Uh, they get their people from, from South, South America a lot of times, and kind of same way, but that's pretty much time frame. And again, it's not a high, high volume uh, of CDLs, but it's a high enough volume in those concentrated areas. It's a lot to get us to get them through there. With that, do we have, um just curious, um, are these individuals international citizens that are coming in and then we're issuing them a special kind of license to do this work? Correct. It's called a non-domicile CDL. Senator Dietrich. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm looking at your flow chart. So if um, and I'm interested in school bus drivers because that's another area where we have a shortage. So if I've got a regular CDL and uh, I want to get the endorsement for school bus. Is it a skills test or is it a training piece that you do online? So for a school's bus endorsement that you will have to do a skills test. You have to come in and do the pre-trip and a drive test to ha on a school bus because there's obviously different um, equipment on a school bus that we want to test you on. That's the feds want to test you on. That's also why the pre-trip's there. 
um, because your stop arm, the doors, your lights, emergency exits, all that stuff, and then also um, how you drive um, is a little bit different, right? Railroad crossings are different for school buses, getting them to understand where they need to stop uh, when they're doing for their kids and all that stuff. So yes, it's it's still a pre-trip and a skid and a, and a drive test for that. And would, are you um, involved in expediting some of those kinds of things during yes, I, August? Perhaps? Yeah, I, actually, there's one other exemption that the federal government's kind of passed along. I just didn't think to mention it. Currently, for school bus drivers, they are waiving the pre-trip inspection portions of it, like the the under the hood. So where you flip the hood up and you're looking for the, the air pump and all the other good stuff, they don't have to, they're going to skip that piece. They still need to do where they're doing the brake check and then the safety equipment inside, but they don't have to do the under hood inspection. So that's helped them out a little bit because they seem to fail there. <laughs> Further questions for Kent? Senator Bowers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here in person, it's Ken. It's it's wonderful to be back, isn't it? Yeah, totally. TV and and uh, so living on the north border of Kansas and going to the west, I appreciate your hands-on, quick response to the the harvest har the custom harvesters in our area too, and especially the COVID era where our bureaus were shut down in rural Kansas, but able to call you and have quick response and taking care of the folks and cutting out the middleman and you're going to them direct for us is a, a big, big help to legislators. So, and everything else that you do for us too with driver's license questions. But I did need to put that out there for rural Kansas with our our wheat harvest. It's very important and they do appreciate it too. Thank you're you, Ken. You're welcome. Thank you. Committee, further questions? Seeing none, thank you, Kent. Appreciate thank you. the presentation. Good you. Committee, I'd like to turn our attention to uh, action on some bills we previously heard. Adam, if you could give us a quick briefing on the bill we heard yesterday, 2594. You can do it from where you're sitting if you like. Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, House Bill 2594 <clears throat> will exempt when certain modifications are made to an antique vehicle. Um, so when they remove the, the procedures for removal of a VIN number and that uh, essentially removing them, when a VIN gets removed or modified, um, it would not be considered contraband um, subject to a seizure um, by a law enforcement officer if the VIN um, or, or a serial number is necessary for the repair or restoration of the antique vehicle. The person completing the repair or restoration reinstalls the serial number or VIN immediately after, and the person has no knowledge um, that the antique vehicle would be stolen. And with that, I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Adam, you or Jill, do you remember what the vote was out of the House? I think it was unanimous. Yes, Mr. Chairman, it's 120 to zero. Committee, what's your pleasure on this bill? Senator Clays. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that the committee recommend 2594 favorably and the item being of a non-controversial nature, it be added to the consent calendar. It's been moved by Senator Clay, seconded by Senator Pittman. Further discussion? Senator Hodge. Um, I'm sorry, I just wanted to clarify. I think I caught in the end of it. Uh, that situation with the 59 Corvette and the asset forfeiture, this this bill doesn't retroactively fix that problem. Is that correct? No, it does not. I, we understood from JR that they're looking at a way in the budget and a proviso possibly to take care of that. Good. I'll, I'll look forward to seeing that when we get down to conference committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Committee, further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Bill's on its way to the consent calendar favorably. Next committee, I'd like to turn our attention to 
Senate Bill 494. Adam, if you could give us a briefing. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senate Bill 494 would provide um, that when the implementation or use of a motor carrier safety improvement um, that would be required by a motor carrier or a motor carrier's related entity would not affect, impact, or change the worker status of a driver. Committee, what's your pleasure on this bill? Senator Bowers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have an amendment that's been prepared on behalf of the Motor Carriers Association that Adam has. And it's inserting a C-section, thank, thank you, on line 21, this section shall be deemed to be supplemental to existing law relating to conditions of employment and related matters. And if we need more clarification, we can ask Tom or Adam. Is, do you know if this is the amendment that took care of the KCC's concerns? Is that correct? Yes, that, that is correct. Excellent. I take that as a motion. Is I'll make that a motion, yes. Is there a second? Seconded by Senator Hawk. Any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed? Amendments adopted. Back on the bill. Committee, what's your pleasure on the bill? Senator Clays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move the committee pass out SB 494 favorably as amended. Do we have a second? Seconded by Senator Pittman. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Another one out. Favorable for passage. Committee, I'd like to turn our attention to the Senate Bill 506, which is a Down Syndrome Bill. License plate. Adam, you want to give us a briefing? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senate Bill 506 provides for the new distinctive license plate, the North Central Kansas Down Syndrome Society license plate. Um, it will be subject to all the usual requirements of a distinctive license plate. Committee, what's your pleasure on this bill? Senator Bowers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have an amendment, and Adam has that. And it's very simple. We had some discussion. Do we have the wording right with the title? Knowing that the North Central Kansas Down Syndrome Society will be spearheading this, but some of the conversation was, do we, do we need to tweak the language a little bit? And thank you. We have just inserted the word awareness two different times in the bill, once in the title and then on line 10. Just a cleanup, I think, to clarify that this is statewide, it's as simple as that. So I'll make that a motion if you're ready. Do we have a second? Second by Senator Tyson. Further discussion? Senator Hawk. Um, I just wanted to make sure, and I think on line 17, the rest of the bill still authorizes the North Central Kansas group to be the, the spearhead of doing this. So we haven't changed that. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, that's, that's why I understand it too. And, and Adam and I talked about that as well, is what you agree to, Adam, that we just thought we should clarify that it is statewide and North Central may have seemed to narrow it in the title. So I think this takes care of it. But yes, I would believe the North Central Kansas would be the spearhead, as we say. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further, Adam? Yes, the amendment essentially just, the license plate itself won't be referred to as the North Central Kansas Down Syndrome Society license plate. It'll now be the Kansas Down Syndrome Awareness license plate. The organization, the North Central Kansas Down Syndrome Society, will still be the sponsoring organization, um, you know, intending, uh, requiring the collection and essentially all the, all the background requirements, they'll be the one spearheading, but it'll just be the plate itself won't be referred to directly under their umbrella. It'll be a broader reference. Thank you. Senator Tyson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just like clarification that um, we had a discussion yesterday and the 
issue that I was concerned about on the custom license plates has been resolved and taken care of, and I appreciate you looking into that. So we won't need an, an amendment dealing with that topic. Thank you. And just so the committee knows, they do offer Department of Revenue, not here now, but they, oh yeah, we are. They do not, uh, didn't see you, Kent, sorry. It's, it's fine. They, they do offer, we check, they do offer the standard plate, the Ad Astra plate, if someone does not want to have the wind turbines on their personalized plate. Uh, they sent out an email with a packet to, I think, to all the senators on the committee. Yesterday came from Florence, so that's been taken care of. Thank you for that question. Committee, further discussion on... Did we, Mr. Chairman, did we vote on the amendment? We haven't adopted the amendment. <laughs> I made the motion. I, I moved it. made the motion. We had a second. I don't remember who. Tyson, yes. Senator Tyson seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Amendment is adopted. We're back on the bill. Senator Bowers. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would make the motion to send out Senate Bill 506 as amended favorably for passage. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Seconded by Senator Hawk. Move it out favorable for passage. Further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Another one out the door. Committee, we may be changing next week's schedule a little bit. There's some other bills being introduced, but... Uh, Plan on having a full week next week. Uh, we're not meeting Monday still. We're going to try and get our work done. We've been doing fairly efficient in committee. That's very much appreciated. With that, we are adjourned. <laughs>